Hi there, I'm Aaron Vissia, and you are watching Upfront from the Alberni Valley, and today's guest is Inspector Brian Hunter from the RCMP. Welcome again to uh, Upfront, and I'm sitting today with uh, Inspector Brian Hunter from the uh, local Alberni Valley RCMP. Welcome to the show, and thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Aaron. I'm uh, actually looking forward to having a conversation about uh, what's going on in our uh, community here. Yes, we probably do have more to talk about than we want. Um, however, let us let's get to know you a bit first. This is the first time we've met, so maybe uh, tell me a bit about yourself and you know where you've come from and uh, how you came to be in Port Alberni. Certainly, um, dating back to my childhood, I was uh, born and raised in uh, Southern Ontario and I uh, actually went to uh, University of Waterloo. Uh, surprisingly, um, when people hear that I have a, a degree in physics and math, they wonder, well, why you're into the police world? And, you know, while I was going to university, uh, I, uh, I just wasn't getting that satisfaction I was looking for in life. And uh, I'm a people person, and uh, I thought, what a better thing to do than become a police officer. So I applied to the RCMP and uh, got posted to British Columbia in uh, 1994. My first posting was uh, Shawnigan Lake. I was there for five and a half years and uh, was looking for an adventure. And uh, my wife and I uh, uh, talked about it. And we went up north uh, to Telegraph Creek, a uh, small isolated post, a uh, population of about 250 people uh, up uh, near the Yukon border parallel to uh, Juneau, Alaska. Middle of nowhere. Middle of nowhere. It, uh, one of the most enjoyable postings I've ever had and uh, just getting involved with the community and uh, getting down to just grassroots of what policing and life is all about. Uh, from there, I was there for two years and then uh, traveled over to Dees Lake. I was promoted there as the operations commander of a once again isolated small uh, detachment and after uh, two years there, uh, we uh, transitioned to Salmon Arm Detachment for a couple of years and then uh, had an opportunity uh, for a promotion back to Deech Lake to be a detachment commander there. Uh, there were some uh, issues happening in the community in relations to uh, uh, First Nations uh, working with uh, uh, industry and wanting to get in there and with my experience they were uh, hoping that I would go up there and, and we did. I was there for a couple of years and then uh, got posted to Williams Lake. Um, one of the busiest uh, medium-sized detachments in the country and a lot of experience there as the operations commander and uh, from there uh, went to uh, Oceanside Detachment. I was at Oceanside Detachment for eight years as the detachment commander there. Mm -hmm. Certainly a lot of experience policing 50,000 people in two municipalities and the, the regional district. Uh, lots going on there and uh, certainly all of those postings uh, uh, prepared me for my uh, promotion to Port Alberni here, uh, which was uh, July of 2016 is when I arrived here. Well, fantastic. You've been here a couple of years, kind of got your feet wet now. Yeah, what's got, going got on. the feet wet. And, and, and having been posted uh, at Oceanside and working in partnership with Port Alberni while I was there, uh, I was aware of uh, the community and uh, a very busy community police-wise uh, for sure. So there were no surprises, uh, but uh, once you're in the chair, it's certainly different. and. Uh, uh, what an exciting job I have here um, leading our police force in, in Port Alberni and uh, uh, my wife uh, she works locally here at the credit union and uh, uh, our immersion into the community has been fantastic uh, just an amazing community uh, it's a great place to work I really love it and it's an even better place uh, to live here in uh, Port Alberni. Excellent. So you have kids as well? Or yeah, I, I have a daughter. She's uh, 22 and a son. Uh, he's 21. Um, my daughter actually is here finishing up her last year at uh, North Island College and then she wants to adventure over into the Okanagan somewhere for her next chapter and uh, my son uh, is here with us uh, as well and uh, uh, yeah. Everyone's just loving it here. Excellent, fantastic. Well, yeah. welcome to God's country, let's say. Well, <laughs> well, well thank you, and it yeah. certainly is. Yeah, excellent. So um, now, unfortunately, we have the, uh, the little more negative part of the talk we're going to have, and uh, let's talk about crime in Port Alberni. And uh, we know it's been on the rise. Um, lots of stuff happening. You describe it as your job is exciting, but I guess that's because there is lots for you to do. Um, tell me about some of the stats and what's been happening here in the last little while. It, it is exciting, and, it, and I wouldn't say we have a negative story here. Mm -hmm. We certainly have an active story uh, of what's going on in, in our community. And um, the membership here are very uh, excited to work here as well. We, we join to be police officers to uh, uh, hold those folks accountable in the community that need to be held accountable. And there's lots of opportunities for our members here to hold uh, people accountable. Uh, certainly uh, in 2017, 
uh, uh, overall crime actually uh, dropped uh, about six uh, percent in the community but property crime uh, was up nine mm percent -hmm. uh, the uh, latter three quarters of 2017 property crime actually rose 17 uh, percent uh, in the community you know we uh, we've made a lot of arrests in 2017 mm -hmm. in relation to uh, property crime uh, we uh, identify our chronic offenders in in the community and, and have a concerted focus effort uh, giving them police attention, uh, holding them accountable if they're on curfews and those types of things. Uh, we have a lot of recidivism in the community where repeat offenders are back out in the community doing what they do best, mm -hmm. getting back into that criminal uh, activity and then we're dealing with them again and putting them through the court. So there are some frustrations there. Mm -hmm. However, uh, there are precedents out there in the court system and uh, rules that they have to follow and uh, I'm not the one to tell them how to do their job uh, nor are they going to tell me how to do ours. So we're a full uh, gas pedal uh, pushing forward mm -hmm. uh, in the community with the crime reduction strategies. Yep. Um, it's great that the city is uh, stepping up uh, in partnership with ourselves and other uh, community stakeholders. Uh, CAO Tim Ply has put forward his uh, uh, big city problems and how to address that. Uh, we're having our poverty re reduction forums. How do we deal with that? Because poverty, uh, it's not the root of everything, but it certainly is common to when we look at uh, a lot of the criminal offenses happening out there, uh, poverty, and mm -hmm. which leads to uh, um, some mental health issues in our community and drug addictions and to feed that habit of course property crime mm -hmm. is happening. I almost don't even need to ask you any questions I could just let you keep talking but uh, is that the main demographics of why the crime is rising and why the property crime is rising in Port it, Alberni? It, it certainly is re related to that mm -hmm. uh, like ultimately if we as a community can uh, dig in and get to the true root of, of what's causing this mm -hmm. uh, where the police do not have to respond to these uh, events anymore is the ultimate. I'm I'm a realist as well. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a, a long, uh, difficult road to go down, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't hop on that uh, road and, and do it. Um, you know, this is a very active community uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to social media and uh, being engaged. And just recently, uh, there's. Uh, they're posting photos of uh, surveillance images mm -hmm. of uh, people that have committed offenses in the community and hey, do you know who this is and, and, and that sort of thing. And, and I like that we're exploring that. I want the community to explore and be aware of your neighbors, be aware of what's going on. But certainly provide that information to the police and, and let the police do the policing. And, and the reason I say that just recently, there was a, an individual that took it upon themselves. Uh, they received information, this is so and so. Mm -hmm. They found out where that person lived. They went and paid them a visit and uh, it wasn't the person. Mm -hmm. And now this victim of property crime has now uh, been arrested for uh, assault and uttering threats and then facing charges in that mm -hmm. regard. It just creates a real dangerous environment. So I really encourage everyone to uh, your eyes, your ears, what's going on out there, report uh, mm -hmm. things that are happening, but report it to the police and let the police do the police work. Yeah. So we're kind of talking about vigilantism and uh, it's an interesting point because I was a victim at one point and I had a, a person in my house in the middle of the night and Luckily, I happened to be up at that moment and ran face to face into this person and who scrambled right out of my house right away. He was caught, um, but it made me obviously very scared for my family. And then I think, okay, after that, I need to protect myself, one. And then two, obviously I'm not gonna go after the person myself. So there's two differences there. How can I protect myself? And obviously you don't wanna be going after somebody yourself. So let's describe that difference for me. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And, and we have the right to protect ourselves and, and I want folks in this community to continue protecting uh, themselves. Mm -hmm. I myself uh, would protect myself and my family if, if something uh, were to happen in, in that regard. It's very frustrating. Uh, the community is getting frustrating. I can assure you the police are frustrated with certain mm -hmm. things that are happening in the community. But we can't allow that frustration to go beyond the point of protecting ourselves in our castles, mm -hmm. which we're allowed to do stretching beyond, okay, let's hunt these people let's down and make them, yeah. them accountable. There's processes, we live in Canada here, there's mm -hmm. processes that we have to go through. Um, vigilantes, they don't have rules. Mm -hmm. The police, we have rules and those rules are there for, for a reason. Um, so it's important that uh, we hold our emotions in check 
yep. uh, for that uh, aspect, but uh, certainly uh, we are allowed to uh, protect ourselves. I just want to talk real briefly ab about that, um, you know, being aware and that type of thing. There was a, a business owner here a few weeks ago mm -hmm. observed some uh, suspicious looking folks and doing some suspicious things in their business, uh, was following them around uh, to mm -hmm. the point where it made these folks uncomfortable. They had a product in their hand, they dropped it and ran. Mm -hmm. uh, the business owner took a couple photos of who they were in the vehicle, passed it on to the police, let the police do their police work. Right. Interestingly enough, uh, they were assisting the police in identifying persons of interest in a crime that had yet to happen in the community. Mm -hmm. Two weeks later, uh, we had a series of uh, break and enters to vehicles, windows mm -hmm. smashed and stuff, and uh, we're drawing a correlation between those people that were there and these uh, vehicle, uh, theft from vehicles that were happening. So it's great, that's what we wanna see. We wanna mm -hmm. see the community helping us out, but the part of dealing with the actual clients and suspects, leave that to the police. Absolutely, so how can I protect myself in my own home? What what things can I do to protect myself? Somebody's coming into my house or breaking in, and even the in the daytime now, they would do that, so. I, I think what's important is <coughs> even Let's create an environment that that doesn't happen mm -hmm. uh, with lots of lighting around your house, lighting. clean those okay. shrub, uh, that shrubbery that uh, mm -hmm. allows a criminal to hide themselves and that type of thing. Surveillance, uh, I'm a big proponent of uh, surveillance. everywhere. Absolutely. You yeah. know what? Uh, we, we know most of the criminals out there and mm -hmm. if suddenly we have a surveillance image, uh, well, this it was this person, immediately, okay, well, we know who that is. Yeah. And then next you know, uh, they're before the courts uh, for an offense. So I think what's important is to prevent that from happening. Uh, the uh, issue where you're in your house and, and somebody comes into your house, uh, absolutely, it's a 911. You have to, if it comes to the point where you have to protect yourself, you're, go you're entitled to do that and, mm -hmm. and you should do yep. that. Safely, of course, yep. uh, don't go beyond your means. Uh, uh, but uh, 911 and get us there uh, immediately. You, mm -hmm. If you make somebody aware that you're aware that are in the house, they're they're more than likely going to leave your yeah. house. And do you guys want all footage from cameras of suspicious things? Um, example, uh, right here in this building you're sitting in, uh, we had some uh, graffiti going on in the back. They were on camera, but hoodies on and everything. We couldn't see who they were, but is that footage you want to see still? There's a lot of value to that, and it may not seem that there's value to, say, yourself mm -hmm. or whoever's seeing that, but here's the thing. Uh, that gets submitted to the police, hey, at 1.30 in the morning on such and such a date, these people were here. Well, maybe you didn't know that two hours previous, there was a shed Somebody broken else, into right. where they had a green hoodie with a yellow stripe. Mm -hmm. Next you know, you have a person with a green hoodie and a yellow stripe here. Okay, so that's who it was. Right. And then we can link them to a green hoodie with a yellow stripe of a person that we know. Next thing you know, there's an arrest. I'm not saying that's going to happen every time, but that might be that little piece of the puzzle that we've been waiting for. Mm -hmm. We, we want to hear about that for sure. Yeah, okay, sounds good. So there was a forum, and I'm just going to refer to a letter that was done by Christine Washington. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a meeting, a committee of the whole, uh, done on December 19th. I assume you were part of that? I was part of that. Okay. And if you have an opportunity to uh, watch that, I, I think there's a lot of value in watching that. I certainly address yep. council. There's a video and on that? Yeah, they, they post their uh, meetings on, on YouTube. Right, and okay. And uh, I, I address, it's about a 15 minute period where I address council and mm -hmm. the community. Uh, we were receiving some criticisms uh, about, you know, the police aren't doing their job. Mm -hmm. And if you mind, I, I, if you don't mind, I'd like to get into that real briefly. Sure, about absolutely. What, what I spoke yep. to there. So, Port Alberni is a very, very uh, busy detachment uh, for the police. Mm -hmm. And we're in a situation uh, where I call it, we go from call to call to call to call, or we're working on those calls. So. A healthy detachment, be it a municipal detachment, RCMP, what have you, uh, you have your general duty members that are responding to our calls for service. Uh, a healthy detachment, 40% of a member's time is what we call they have proactive time. Mm -hmm. The only way you can reduce your crime in your community is that proactive time. So proactive time means you're doing your foot patrols, mm -hmm. you're doing your bar checks, you're doing surveillance on drug dealers, criminal activity, you're stopping vehicles, all of those things, you're doing the extra mile. We're monitoring our chronic offenders. We're doing our curfew checks. That's all proactive time because we're not being called 911 responding to these things. So we like about 40% of our time to be proactive. That's healthy. Mm -hmm. Port Alberni, and we've been running the, the numbers. There's a, a complex computer system. We're all on computers now, and what are the members doing? So everything the members are doing is logged. 
we're running at 9% proactive time with our general duty members. So what that means is less than six minutes an hour on average, we have time to do those proactive things mm -hmm. that bring down the crime in the community. So when we hear things, you know, the police aren't doing their job, those members are going call to call to call. Remembering that some of these calls, there's 10 hours of uh, paperwork mm -hmm. behind the scenes, that little one, yeah. chunk of ice under the iceberg that yep. we're working on uh, behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So it's frustrating, but what's frustrating uh, as well, uh, and I get it for the city and the community, policing is very expensive in mm -hmm. the city of Port Alberni. It's a $7 million budget for a community of less than 17,000 people. We have the highest per capita cost for policing of any municipal RCMP detachment that polices a community larger than 15,000 in the province. Well, wow. nobody even comes close. So here we have a situation where our detachment is under-resourced to deal with the crime that's happening in our community. Mm -hmm. Under-resourced. Yep but we're also currently the most expensive police force. Mm -hmm. There's a balance out there. So what we do is we be as efficient as we can with our resources, prioritizing life and limb safety. That's number one, we're responding to those calls. So for example, uh, they call the police, we've had a break into our shed, uh, we have a, a chainsaw missing. There's frustrations out there. Oh, the police took two hours or three hours. You know what, it might take four hours. We mm -hmm. might not respond till the next day because we're responding to these calls for service, yep. uh, serious calls. But it's priority, obviously. It's prioritizing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of the Crime Severity Index uh, Stats Canada produces this annually. So for 2016, uh, and this is any municipality across the country mm -hmm. with a population of 10,000 or more, uh, the violent crime severity, so how violent is your community? Uh, Port Alberni was number two uh, in the province and number 10 in the country. Wow. of 305 municipalities. It's a busy detachment. Not where we want to be, really. <laughs> no, it's not where no. we want to be. And uh, CAO Ply, uh, mm -hmm. bringing forward his report and working with council, uh, I think it's fantastic. We're talking about it because mm -hmm. We haven't really talked about it before, not at this level for sure. So getting community engagement, business engagement, city engagement uh, to make a difference to get to the root issues in the community. Mm -hmm. couple, couple things I saw in uh, the letter that was presented to the city, um, it was after the meeting, uh, was a couple points of uh, movement of the community policing office. Uh, onto 3rd Avenue and apparently there's space available or that's offered for free. Is that one thing you guys are looking at doing or? It's absolutely <coughs> something that we're looking at but I need to mm -hmm. put a caveat in there. Mm -hmm. uh, the concept of placing a community policing office in the 3rd and Argyle area yep. is brilliant. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. There's nothing more that uh, we would like as a detachment to have a true community policing office up there. And tr when I say true, uh, a community policing office, they were designed as like little satellite uh, detachments, mm -hmm. often in the problem areas in the community, that would house not just volunteers, but mm -hmm. RCMP officers, uh, volunteers. Uh, but for that, uh, it's not just a matter of let's put the office in this uh, uh, space that's abandoned at the moment. So mm -hmm. we are looking in through our departmental security what is required. If we're going to move that community policing station, mm -hmm. it will be set up that our community policing uh, officer in charge of community policing, Amelia Hayden, will that will be her workspace, a police officer. Right. And another workspace for uh, an RCMP officer to go there and do police work. Mm -hmm. You know, we have clients that we deal with in that area, and what a better place around the corner, okay, go into the office, deal with stuff. Yep. Somebody wants to come in for an interview. So ultimately, that's fantastic. Yep. That's going to come with a lot of dollars. It's putting s presence in the center of the issue. Right? Absolutely. So it's a great idea, yep. but it does not come without uh, proper thought mm -hmm. and with that it uh, it's not going to be a cheap endeavor and uh, as we all know uh, the money in the community just isn't falling from trees to be handed out so mm -hmm. we, we need course. to have a look at that yep. so I'm working with the city we've already had some on-site uh, uh, visits there but I, I'm a realist here mm -hmm. uh, and we need to be real about what a community policing office truly looks like there yep. and uh, if we were to get a community policing office as I described in there it's the members are excited about it. Mm -hmm. If we had a true community policing office, yep. uh, they would love to be working out of there. Great. So what other things can we look at doing as citizens of the Valley to help the RCMP? And I know there was auxiliary police uh, assisting before. Is there programs like that still in place uh, that people can get involved? Th there are. So the RCMP mm -hmm. auxiliary program uh, was uh, 
put on hold for uh, a period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, an incident in Alberta where there was a shooting and there was an RCM, uh, auxiliary RCMP uh, as well that was injured. Mm -hmm. uh, so we put it on pause and had a look about safety uh, concerns, liabilities, those type of things. So we're just now into there's going to be a phase uh, um, uh, uh, tier one, tier two, tier three type of community volunteer mm -hmm. right back up to tier three where they're in a uniform. Uh, not exactly like the RCMP, but mm -hmm. auxiliary where they ride along with us and carry on. So that's just happened in the last couple of weeks, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a national standard. So we're just waiting on the province. Uh, what does our auxiliary program look like? And mm -hmm. then we'll be ramping that up, of course. But in the interim, we, we have citizens on patrol, and we're just working uh, with our citizens on patrol group right now uh, with Corporal Amelia Hayden. She's in charge. Mm -hmm. uh, Dennis Sove is actually the president of Citizens Patrol. We've just created and we're doing training for uh, foot patrols for our citizens uh, patrol. Important to realize these are volunteers in the community. It's just eyes and ears. They're mm -hmm. going to be going around our community, walking around, uh, providing information to the regular members. Hey, we see this, we see that. We may have a, a car that we're looking for in an indiv individual, mm -hmm. and uh, what a better opportunity than uh, to have a volunteer give us a call. Hey, uh, corner of whatever and whatever, there's that car yep. you're looking for. So more lights, cameras are welcome. I, uh, uh, you're, Surveillance cameras yeah. are huge. Mm -hmm. uh, the number of crimes that we've solved and arrested people based on surveillance uh, is uh, remarkably high. Mm -hmm. Like I said, we know the criminals in the community and if we have an image of it was this person there, it's black and white. That gives us the opportunity to arrest them, bring them into the detachment. We interview them, and more often than not, we find out they've done all of these other. Surveillance is huge, mm -hmm. and uh, the city's looking at uh, a program, part of the big city problems, what can the city do? Uh, perhaps uh, a little subsidy to business owners that want to get uh, uh, surveillance systems. Mm -hmm. It's not set in place, and it's not for me to speak to, but I know the city's looking at that, which is great. Yep. And um, as far as cleaning up the city too, when things like graffiti are done, uh, we were told paint it over. My thought is, well, if I paint it over, they're just going to go on top of it and think they have a new canvas. What's the thought behind that? The thought behind it is exactly what you initially said. Mm -hmm. There's graffiti, paint it over immediately. Yep. Uh, the city, uh, city works have uh, kits, they'll bring the paint to you. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to keep the city clean. What happens is there's graffiti, then they're marking over the graffiti. Sometimes there's a little territorial thing going on with yep. these individuals, but we need to, to finish that off. Lighting in the community, uh, the city is certainly working on that. Cleaning up the alleys, cleaning up these buildings. We're looking at these uh, nuisance building, the nuisance building bylaw. Mm -hmm. Certainly the Carlson building has already been designated. There looking at the Harborview apartments now. This is very important. This is big. Already the, the owners of these buildings are, are snapping to attention, so mm -hmm. to speak, and, and realizing uh, perhaps their buildings are causing some of the issues in our, our community. Mm -hmm. So all of these things are going to lead toward uh, reducing crime yep. is the ultimate goal, and I believe it's going to happen. Okay, I want to get into one more thing quickly. I know we're, we're a little bit short on time, but uh, uh, and looking at my own case again, gentleman broke into my house. He was caught. Dogs came out. They had him within an hour. Fantastic. They arrest him. They put him in jail for a couple of days. He goes to court. Uh, I learned that he had 40 or 50 charges prior to the one in my home. Four or five days, he's out doing it again. That must be part of your frustration, and I know you, you touched on this earlier. Any thoughts on that? I, I have a lot of thoughts I on that. I bet you do. And um, once again, uh, not being critical of our system doesn't mean I can't be frustrated with our system. Well, it's, uh, the community's frustrated with stuff like that. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I gave uh, some uh, really concrete examples a couple of meetings ago at council. Mm -hmm. Identifying exactly what you're talking about. Here's client A, 34 arrests, mm -hmm. all of these charges held for the weekend, went to court, uh, released on conditions. Two days later, they're committing the crimes. It's very, very frustrating. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're working with Crown Counsel. Uh, Gord uh, Baines is our admin crown here. He's uh, back in the chair. We're very excited about that. Mm -hmm. uh, he's lived in this community uh, for years and years and years. He knows what's going on. He's a great partner to have uh, yep. with the police uh, to, to work on. These are chronic offenders. Mm -hmm. And a chronic offender should be held accountable at every moment, every opportunity that we have to hold them accountable. And if they don't want help, 
they should be in jail so they're not causing mm -hmm. this havoc in our community. That's the whole yep. crime reduction, focusing on chronic offenders. Is there something we can do? Should we lobby our MPs, our MLAs? saying the laws need changing? I, I met with our uh, MP last week. Mm -hmm. I've met with our MLA. We maintain a solid communication. Mm -hmm. They know what the issues are and they're certainly on our side and they are lobbying in that direction. Um, our Mayor Mike Rattan is aware of the issues. Mm -hmm. He actually uh, met with Crown uh, and met with the judge and expressed his frustrations. Yep. So everyone's aware. Uh, there's not much more that can happen in that regard. I can tell you, uh, the police, we're going to continue doing what we're doing, mm -hmm. uh, breaching these individuals out when they're uh, on conditions and they're going against those conditions, putting them before uh, the judge again. Uh, this person's not listening to your orders, and while they're not listening to your orders, they're committing crimes in the community. So uh, let's try to hold these folks uh, accountable. And I'll give you one interesting uh, anecdote uh, scenario here. Mm -hmm. uh, on Friday, this past Friday and uh, Saturday, there were three individuals in our community that were arrested. Chronic property mm -hmm. offenders. And I'm not saying they're responsible for the offenses that happened. They were arrested. One was for a breach of probation. Another was breach. Another was warrants. Uh, a prolific uh, thief out mm -hmm. of uh, Alberta. They're arrested. So we've had uh, uh, property crimes up significantly in 2018. The three are arrested, so the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, not one B&E, not mm -hmm. one theft from vehicle while these folks were uh, in custody. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they're responsible for the things that were happening, but it's interesting that they're in jail and none of these types of offenses occur for that period of time. The one was sent back to Alberta uh, to go deal with serious charges there. Yep. Uh, the other two were remanded. They're actually appearing in court today. It certainly says something. So it does. Keep up the good work, um, you and your members, of course, and uh, thank you for being on the show. I know that was a quick half hour. We probably got a lot more to talk about, so maybe we'll have you back sometime. That was a quick half hour. It was. And uh, <laughs> certainly uh, I'd be more than happy to come back and uh, talk about some other things in the community. But let's not be negative about this. This is an awesome community, and uh, let's, let's just keep heading in the direction of looking for solutions, mm -hmm. recommendations, not the negative part, what can we do to make it better. Fantastic. Thank you. Inspector Brian Hunter, uh, you've been watching Upfront. I'm Aaron Vissia. And hey, if you want to have something to say or you want to get involved, find a way to do it.